Hi, I'm Dee Dee, and I've worked in coffee for over a decade. I love coffee, and as much as I've learned about coffee in that time, my desire to learn more has only grown. Coffee is a daily, simple pleasure to us, and I love that. But it's also fun to explore the complexities, not only in flavor, but where it comes from, how it's made, and what it says about us. There's still so much to discover. In this show, I'm talking with coffee people in and around my hometown of Atlanta to seek deeper insights, explore the future of the beverage, and find out what makes us tick. Today, join me as I discuss roasting with Chip Grabo of Radio Roasters and Jared Carr of East Pole Coffee. My name's Dee Dee and I'm a barista. I first started making coffee when I was in college and it wasn't long before I realized that I was learning more from making coffee than I was in the university setting. I wasn't just learning about how to make coffee though. I was learning about social issues and chemistry. I was learning about the history of coffee. It was all so fascinating to me. With every page I turned, I just wanted to learn more. And here I am, 10 years later, still completely enamored with the topic. Back when I started making coffee though, the roasting scene was nothing to speak of here in Atlanta. But it took people from my generation kind of coming up and wanting to show what they had to offer. Or people from other towns coming to Atlanta and giving us some new flavor. Today, I'm talking to a couple of them. Jared from East Pole Coffee and Chip from Radio Roasters and learning a little bit from them about why they started doing this and what's motivating them to keep the movement going. Hey, uh, we're here with Chip at Radio Roasters in Scottsdale, Georgia, and we're gonna have some coffee. What are you gonna make me today? Uh, we're gonna start you off with uh, our new Ethiopia Shikizo Guji, just a yeah. washed Ethiopian. That's our favorite right now. What about the flavor is special to you for coffees from Guji? Um, you know, Ethiopian, I, I'm a sucker for Ethiopian coffees just purely just for the complexity and the, there's, there's always fascinating florals to them. I mean, it's just a very different profile than what uh, most of us are used to with coffee. And, um, and what we're discovering with Guji, um, it's that in spades. And it's sort of an endless search when you go to Ethiopia looking for, for coffee and just discovering like, Oh my gosh, that last one was really good, but this is even more floral and even more flavors going on. What's different when you go to approach an Ethiopian coffee versus like a, a Central or South American coffee in the roaster? It's mostly, you know, just being really careful not to, not to get that roast going too fast, too much momentum, um, and then, you know, ending the roast too high. Um, you know, we're trying to practice that art, just kind of coasting in at around 400 and not too far past that. And that's, mm -hmm. it's always tricky to do. And you start, you know, if you get used to doing a whole bunch of, you know, Central American coffees for a while and then suddenly jump into an Ethiopian roast, you kind of have to back off the energy earlier on. That's, that's what we found. Um, Cause it can get, just get going faster. We had some Mexican coffee that would, you'd have to put a lot of energy into it just to get to first crack. And if you did that to the Ethiopian, you'd probably ruin it. It just would roast too fast, too dark. Um, what is this first crack moment? First crack is when the energy in the coffee, it's a lot like popcorn. It's when the moisture in the, um, in the bean actually is, there's so much pressure there. It's just, it's literally popping. So you hear, you literally hear it. And it starts off with like a little few clicks and pops here and there. And then it just turns into a full, full throated um, pop, popping session. So it's a lot like popping popcorn. How long does that last? Uh, roughly about a minute to two minutes. Mm -hmm. And then you keep, you, that's when you're starting to get, you're starting to, you're constantly taking the trier and smelling the coffee and kind of sensing like, okay, how's it developing? Do I like the smell? How's the color? You're doing all these, you know, quicker uh, assessments of, of how the coffee is developing and, get, and anticipating, you know, dropping the mm -hmm. coffee out of the roaster. Uh, but roughly, you know, 90 seconds to two minutes. So you're using a lot of uh, your like human skills, like your sight, smell, senses, sound, yeah, your sensory. senses. 
You do. We, I mean, we lean a lot on our on our computer data logger that's reading all the temperature and time and taking or making measurements and and recording all of our different energy moves and air movements. But it really comes down to just your sense of smell and color and hearing, which is part of my fascination with with roasting. Is like you are using you know almost all of your senses to assess. Hey, is this coffee? where I want it to be, you know, am, am I going to, is this going to, am I going to represent the ro the grower and is it going to represent our company the way I want it to? So, um, you can, you know, rely on computers and machines to a certain degree, but ultimately it's, you know, you got to decide, do I like, is it, does it smell right? And is it really ready for me to open that door and let those beans drop out and start cooling or, or not? How do you know when it's done? Um, yeah, <laughs> it's like asking a painter, when do you know when you're done <laughs> with your artwork? Um, you know, for, for me, we have general guidelines. Here's your, here's your brood Guji. Thank you. Um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of watching, you know, our past profiles. We're sort of, once we've settled on a profile, we're basically kind of trying to repeat that and kind of watching, Hey, are we, are we, is this, are we about the, at the, about the point where we, that last roast we did that we liked, where we dropped there. But it's also, again, it's sensory, like, yeah, we've reached that point, but it still looks a little bit light or it doesn't quite smell ready. So there's, there's just that last minute, it's all sensory mm -hmm. uh, kind of assessment. It sounds a lot like brewing coffee too, or uh, pulling a shot of espresso. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, you can, you can pull a shot one day and with, one, with a set of parameters and the next day come in and it's a whole different beast for, for whatever reason. You can follow all the numbers and still it may not taste right. So it all comes down to like, ultimately, how does it, does it taste where we want it to be? This tastes great. Thank you. Do you get jasmine? What are the, what are the notes you get? Um, I get a little bit of floral in the flavor, a little bit of jasmine, but what's hitting me the most is like an like almond marzipan sweetness. Oh, wow. It's very sweet. Yeah. And a, a body to match that flavor. Oh, good. That's a good coffee. And I put that all on the grower and the importer and a little bit on me, the roaster. <laughs> <laughs> team but, efforts. I mean, what, yeah, team effort. Um, but that's the big thing we've learned is like we can, we can roast something perfectly and it still may not be that great. And it just, it's, it's really has a lot to do with the origin and the grower and just the bean you're starting with. Um, it tastes like sweet tea. Wow. That's good here in Georgia. So uh, when I first met you, you were a barista. What made you interested in um, checking out roasting? So that goes back to what made me interested in coffee in general. Um, I was at UGA and I was studying uh, international affairs. And um, part of studying international affairs is you have to have a foreign language that you're proficient in. And so I was studying Indonesian and my goal with international affairs was to work for the FBI. I wanted to be a field agent. Um, and so I had an opportunity in 2013 to go live in Indonesia for a little while, for like six months. And, uh, and I thought it was a good opportunity to like hone in on my language skills a little bit. And so while I was living there, kind of on the side of other things that I was doing for this company, um, I would ride around on my motorcycle in Indonesia and go meet coffee farmers and the more I started to meet these coffee farmers the more I just my eyes were just like super opened up to how cool these people were how big this process was like it was way bigger than I could have ever even imagined it didn't take m many farmer interactions before I was just like this this is amazing and this is like what I want to do and so my my passion to work for the FBI like quickly just like kind of dwindled down and my passion for coffee was just like blossoming there. Like I knew that if I roasted, then I would be able to meet a lot of great farmers, be able to impact a lot of different people by um, working with them, working with their farms. And, um, and so I knew when I came home, that's something I wanted to get involved in. And so I uh, moved back in 2013, uh, towards the end of 2013, um, and got a job at Rev Coffee Roasters. So it was, it was pretty fun. How did you start roasting? So I started roasting on a whirly pop because I was just so curious, like literally a popcorn maker. Um, I was buying coffee from Sweet Maria's and it was mainly just like a hobby. Like I was just like very intrigued by it. Um, and it's comical to like think back now, like roasting on a whirly pop in my kitchen. Um, and then 
I was I was doing that at home, um, and then I was working as a production assistant over in at Rev. Kind of got to like be around the roasting process and and kind of take it in, um, and then just started like eating up anything I could like reading wise. Um, there's not so much on the internet about roasting like it's a pretty big void that I wish specialty coffee could like remedy. Um, and I think there are certain people that are doing a really good job of kind of like opening up that conversation. Like um, Cat and Cloud has a really great podcast that, um, that they're just open to. Um, but a lot of it was like reading Scott Rail's book and, uh, and just absorbing anything that I possibly could um, so that when, when we did get our roaster um, that we could, that I could at least have some kind of base principle of understanding of how to do it instead of just starting from, from scratch. So how long have you been roasting? Well, that's, that's the business is about three years old. I've been roasting a little bit longer than that if you count roasting on your stove top in a popcorn popper. You did it. Yeah. Awesome. Where yeah, were you getting your green beans for that? Sweet Maria's. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I started. I'd loved coffee my whole life since high school. Um, and always knew that there were good, I had good cups and bad cups, but never knew what the reason was. Like I went into this cafe and they look like they know what they're doing, but I walked out with this cup that just wasn't satisfying, but I never knew how to, what was responsible for that or why that would be. And I kind of didn't discover that till, you know, specialty coffee kind of came on my radar and mostly roasting. And then once I tasted, you know, home roasted, even coffee that I was probably not roasting that great, the freshness, um, just made all the difference. My full-time job was in the news business at CNN and before that at NPR, and that's my, my career. And that's really satisfying, but that, that was sort of like generating a product that just kind of goes off into the ether, that goes off, the, it's broadcast, and you don't really know who your customers are. And I just had this urge to, to create something that actually you're hand, something tangible you're handing to people. And that realization just kind of happened at the same time I came along and discovered roasting. Um, and it just became just like this obvious thing. It wasn't even like a light bulb moment. It was just like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to like, this is, the, this is the, the tangible product I want to give to people where I get to like actually say, hey, here you go. Here's a bag of coffee that, you know, it's kind of crafted. It's ma handmade by me. And I just feel like it's my creation. That sounds a lot like uh, the rest of the line, though, is that you have all of these people like essentially holding hands all the way down to the final part where the barista is handing over a cup of coffee yeah. to uh, a guest. Yeah. And I feel that with, uh, along with all the mystery and coffee of things to discover or things to learn, that human connection is something that brings people like yourself who've had this amazing career to still take this little chunk of their time or large chunk of their time and devote it to that personal handoff. Yeah, you feel a little bit of responsibility in that whole chain. So with, with roasting, uh, you started off on a small roaster in the garage of a friend. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, what a great way to give yourself some time to learn before opening up the big deal, right? Oh yeah, definitely. What were some of the challenges you experienced going from that smaller roaster to a full-size production roaster? Yeah, so um, the small roaster that we started on was uh, that U.S. roaster core, it's a three kilo. And then when we moved to this big roaster um, that's over here, it's about five times bigger than what we had. Um, I would say some of the adjustments I had to make were um, different temperature readouts, and that's just because probes, the, the probes were at different levels, different depths, and it can mess with like the numbers that you're used to um, playing with. And so, for example, if I was used to a drop temperature, with, like where I would drop it from the, the um, drum to the tray, let's say I'm used to one at like 402 degrees. Now on this roaster, it was at 390 or 385. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I first started, I was like, whoa, this is, this is weird. Like, why are these numbers not lining up? Um, and you, you get to figure out like, oh, it's because the, the thermometer is not in as far as it was the other way or vice versa. Um, and also, adjustments happen really, really fast on the new, on our San Franciscan roaster. Um, and so it was really cool. I, I wasn't having to play three steps ahead of every roast. I was making an adjustment and expecting it to, to make that adjustment itself immediately. And so that was really fun. But at first <laughs> my roasts were so fast and I was just like trying to figure out like what in the world is going on. But you have to go through those kind of things to figure out like to get some kind of idea. And I by no means am an expert in like always want to be learning about roasting and there's so much more to learn about it. 
but you do have to go through some things and be like, oh, if, if somebody comes in, which there will be plenty more roasters in Atlanta coming through, like if they have questions, hopefully I'm able to have gone through that and be like, oh yeah, this is what you're doing or maybe you should try this or, or something. Have you had any mentors along the way? Um, definitely like business mentors. Um, so when I moved to Kirkwood, Taproom Coffee was not even open yet. And, and so um, I, I started working there. I was one of the first baristas that started working there and um, getting uh, to kind of work underneath Jonathan Pasquale as the owner there was really beneficial for me, um, especially just seeing the, the business side of him and the decisions that he would make and just kind of like the everyday things that would come about. It was really helpful for me just as um, wanting to do that myself. Um, it was, it was really great. And him and I are really good friends today. Uh, and so it's always really helpful to kind of shoot him a text or call him like, hey, did you, did you figure, what did you do in, in this situation? And so uh, it's good to have that feedback. And it's, it's also good to have someone who's also open to talk about business and talk about coffee. I feel like the coffee culture can sometimes feel really closed off and really like, see, like everything, everybody's got their own thing. But it's really, I mean, everybody's figuring it out. Everybody's working with the same, we're all working with coffee, right? And we're, um, we're service industry people. So it's, it's starting to change a lot and that's really cool. And I think, especially in Atlanta, it's starting to change a lot too. Um, but yeah, just a lot of reading and a lot of podcasts and YouTube videos. Yeah, I think it's in our best interest as a community to um, maintain communication and improve that any way we can, whether that's through like having podcasts or um, forums that we can uh, reference. Yeah, definitely. And now, the peaceful hour. The pleasure of each other's company when a cup of coffee is part of the calm and quiet. A lot of people know what we're talking about. And at times like these, share the mellow, cozy flavor of delicious coffee. You know the feeling. You want a cup of coffee. You want it so bad you can almost taste it. And if you're like 25 million other Americans, the way you want it to taste is rich, smooth, mellow. And what coffee? Rich and mellow. Special coffee, because it's made with special beans. For taste and aroma so deliciously rich. Smooth, rich coffee without a hint of bitterness. Beautiful. Just the way I've always wanted coffee to taste. Well, those guys were great. Join us next time where Jerry takes us through the process of an entire roast. I love you. Bye-bye.